Welcome everyone. It's, uh, I'm Brendan Bradley. It's my pleasure to introduce Mark Stringer this morning. Uh, Mark's one of uh, the academics here at the University of Canterbury and a key participant in Flagship 2, uh, Local Faction Effects on Land and Infrastructure. So he's going to be talking to us today about a large package of work happened over the last couple of years in the North Island region associated with pernicious soil. So I look forward to hearing it, Mark. Great. Thank you uh, very much, Brendan, for the introduction. Um, yeah, as uh, Brendan alluded to, I'm going to be um, my time today talking really about um, some work that we've been doing. I've been doing in collaboration uh, with the University of Auckland, primarily um, trying to establish um, what the dynamic response of uh, natural commercial deposits uh, is like. Um, so the first thing is really to think about pumice soils in general and its context in New Zealand. And essentially, uh, pumice-rich uh, soils are found across a broad area of the North Island. Uh, they are from a series of eruptions uh, taking place from the, uh, largely from the Taupo volcanic zone. And initially, these soils are ejected from the volcano. They fall as uh, airfall deposits uh, in situ, and then they can exist in uh, a number of states today. So they either exist where they fell, in which case they can either be welded, uh, which means they've got some cementation between the grains, or unwelded. And in some cases, they can be reworked by the processes of uh, rain and then rivers. Uh, so for us, interested in uh, liquefaction effects, uh, I'm going to be focusing on essentially the response of uh, these reworked Which one? Because I think it's it's coming from the box, right? Yeah, can you turn that box? I guess we can just do that, huh? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're going to be focusing on the response of these reworked um, permissive soils. And they're encountered on a number of um, projects of engineering significance, uh, and in particular uh, throughout the Hamilton uh, Basin and the areas of Taranga, and where we've been doing our, um, I'll be talking a bit about some type of testing, which is uh, being carried out on specimens um, from the Bay of Plenty and uh, the Hamilton area. The Um, so one of the interesting things to consider is what do we know about uh, what has happened in the past in previous earthquakes and during 1987 during the Edgecombe earthquake some liquefaction was observed in the areas around Edgecombe uh, and Fakatani. Uh, in the ensuing uh, characterization or reconnaissance work and subsequent characterization of the soil profiles in that area uh, it was typically found that uh, there would be layers of loose sands in the upper few meters of the soil profile, followed by medium to dense sands, uh, and then uh, these interpeded uh, layers of uh, silts, sands, and peat. Um, when the uh, observations of liquefaction were mapped out, uh, they were typically concentrated in uh, just a few areas, in particular around Fakatane, and on these uh, areas um, on the plains and a few localized areas around Edgecombe. Uh, one of the key things, of course, is that similar to many other earthquakes, liquefaction responses is often um, concentrated around uh, rivers and uh, recent uh, alluvial deposits. Um, so this is what I'm showing here is actually some work from recent uh, paper by Arensi et al. And where they're actually showing a comparison of the simplified methods of um, Boulanger and Idris and um, Cayenne et al. for a site um, near the town of Edgecombe. So um, at this particular location here on the right-hand bank of the river. And uh, on the left-hand side, we've got the uh, CPT profile um, for the location uh, of interest. This is one of the sites that we've done uh, undisturbed sampling at. Um, the key point here 
is that irrespective of uh, the method you choose, what we find in these um, sites is consistently the predicted liquefaction resistance is significantly lower uh, than the um, estimated demand. And so you'd expect um, very large manifestations of uh, liquefaction based on our understanding of what the demand and water table position would have been like at the time of the Edgecombe earthquake. Um, so really the focus of today's talk is then going to be um, or more widely about this project is trying to understand a little bit more about these soils and how we can try and compare them perhaps against um, hard grain soils and try and figure out then um, in the longer term whether we can try and um, develop uh, simplified procedures or adjustments to existing simplified procedures which can help us come up with tools to predict whether liquefaction is going to be an issue uh, in a future earthquake scenario. Uh, so uh, key questions then are uh, firstly how should we even characterize these materials? Um, how does the liquefaction resistance compare to hard grain soils? And as part of that when we want to do our comparisons to the laboratory we need to consider how best to get natural samples of these soils into the laboratory in a state which is going to allow us to test them um, against uh, established field parameters such as the um, penetration resistance from a CPT. Um, pumice as a material uh, has some very particular properties. Um, for me, uh, a lot of these are best understood by examining the microstructure uh, of the soil grains. And what I'm showing here are two SEM images of um, sand-sized particles that were uh, obtained from our sampling um, uh, attempts in Fakatane. Um, the key thing is that when we consider pumice grains on their own, they tend to be very lightweight, and we can see that uh, it's going to come as a result um, of their um, honeycombed or very um, complex structures. Uh, typically, what we'll have is that at the time of eruption, uh, there'll be obviously um, liquid magma, and then they're getting um, uh, ejected from the volcano. During that process, gases are uh, coming out of the um, liquid and creating these internal void structures within the grains. So that creates um, a very lightweight uh, structure. Um, the direct consequence of the gas being um, coming out of the liquid is that we have this internal porous structure of these soil grains and you can see evidence of this uh, in the two SEM photos. Uh, clearly, if we're dealing with um, now a grain, which is not a solid material in the sense that we would normally think of a soil grain, but one which is composed of lots of internal voids, we've got a whole series of very thin cell walls within an individual soil grain. So when we apply stresses onto these grains, uh, we get very high stress concentrations on the cell walls, and as a result, uh, the grains become very, very crushable. Um, Arensi and Pender have uh, previously noted uh, that you can typically crush pumice grains uh, under the pressure of a fingernail uh, on the table. So uh, very crushable uh, compared to uh, normal soils. That particular aspect is captured in this top right hand corner uh, where the, and I'm taking this from the Arensi et al. paper from 2013, uh, where the crushing strength of individual grains of silica sand are compared against um, those that you find for pumice sands. Uh, one of the key points here is that there's a real range in the crushing strength of pumice soils, okay, so of pumice grains. And so um, this is the first indication uh, that there's some additional complexity and that not all pumice is going to behave in the same way. Um, this is uh, on the bottom left hand side, I'm showing what I consider to be one of the key um, problems when we're dealing with pumice soils in situ. Uh, this is taken from a study by Wesley et al. from 1999, 
And what it's showing is um, a series, the results from a series of calibration chamber tests, uh, where you get a big drum of soil um, placed at a particular uh, density, and you essentially put a, a CPT probe through the middle of it. Um, what, I'm sh what it shows is that for hard grain soils, these are the two quartz curves, the CPT is extremely sensitive to relative density. Whereas in um, tests where pure pumice materials, so they've got commercially available pure pumice, uh, were placed in these calibration chambers, they found that the cone resistance was essentially insensitive to relative density. Um, so that has some very particular uh, consequences um, for the use of the CPT as a um, indicator of or predictor of liquefaction resistance. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Um, what I wanted to show or talk about here was really one of our big aims of this project is to try and um, understand how we can try and provide uh, tools for practicing engineers to understand what the li likely liquefaction resistance of uh, pumiceous soils are likely to be when they're encountered <laughs> on a project. Um, to do that, uh, what we aim to do is to collect undisturbed samples of high quality, uh, bring them back to the lab, test them for cyclic resistance, and then com um, come up with those uh, adjusted simplified methods. Uh, one of the important things to realize is that uh, when we uh, perform undisturbed sampling with advanced sampling techniques, not all techniques are equal. And that depending on the soil type you're in, you can find that one method is distinctly preferable over another. Um, in the context of liquefaction resistance, uh, the Japanese showed that this was extremely important if you were trying to sample clean sands. And that at the time, in the 80s, when these studies were first carried out in Japan, that um, when they tried to uh, sample clean sands, uh, they found that loose deposits got denser and dense deposits got looser. And so they were inferring for a long time that the look for action resistance of um, clean sand deposits tended to be um, a uniform uh, level. In reality, what was happening was that the relative density of these soils was changing significantly as a result of the sampling process. And so they were essentially in the lab testing uh, soils in a similar initial state. And so one of the challenges for us was to understand how best to sample these soils in the field to get reasonable results when we come back to the laboratory. So in the early phase of our project, um, one of the things we were looking at was trialing different sampling techniques. And available here to us in New Zealand were um, the Dames and Moore sampling, which is essentially a thin-walled sampler. You push a um, tube of, of brass, which has a low friction angle, um, under the action of hydraulic pressure, directly into the ground, and you recover the soil sample. Um, the trick, the key aspects of this sampler is that the the wall thickness has got to be relatively thin to try and reduce uh, the strains uh, associated with the penetration of the sampler, and that you use brass tubes to keep the friction angle um, against the side of the uh, walls of the tube down. What it means is you're just um, inducing less shear stresses as you penetrate um, the tube into the ground, and so hopefully you get less disturbance. Uh, on the right-hand side, um, I'm showing two simplified diagrams of a technique called gel push. It's an emerging technique which has come out of Japan uh, to address the sampling of uh, sands, and in particular, silty sands and uh, clean sands. Um, in the study, we trialed two different iterations of the tool, or two different versions of the tool, which are intended to capture two different uh, types of material. So first, the gel GPS, gel push static, and it's essentially the same as a thin-walled um, sampler with the incorporation of a, a low-friction polymer gel. So the low-friction polymer gel is contained within the tube, and as we advance the sample tube into the ground, some of this polymer gel is basically brought through the tube towards the point of entry of the soil into the soil sampler. 
It coats the soil sample in this low friction gel and um, is intended to eliminate all of the sidewall friction that you would normally have in a undisturbed sampling technique. Um, if you can eliminate the sidewall friction, um, then hopefully uh, you uh, eliminate sample disturbance, uh, certainly as a result of the um, friction as the soil is entering the tube. On the right hand side, we have a second iteration of the same technique. Again, there's a polymer gel, which is going to coat the soil sample as it enters the sampling tube. Um, this is called the triple tube sample, and it works a bit like a Masia core barrel. And so we have a um, outer reaming uh, device, which is basically cutting the soil um, just behind a uh, sample uh, cutting shoe. The internal portion of this device stays um, basically stationary um, and whilst the reaming shoe is uh, spinning around the outside um, of the central uh, portion of the tool. Uh, so again, uh, as this soil penetrates, we're coating the soil samples in this gel and trying to eliminate um, friction. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen uh, gel push in action, um, what I'm showing here is a soil sample that's just been recovered from the ground and we've removed um, basically the front portion of the tool as we try and recover the soil sample out of the gel push sampler. And what you're seeing here, this white stuff is um, the polymer gel. And when we find that the sampling has gone well, um, you can move a meter long section of core. Uh, so it's probably about 10 kilos of soil within a sample tube with two fingers. Okay, so very, very light pressure, uh, very low um, friction. So we trialed um, those three techniques um, at a site in Fakatane, and the initial um, aim of uh, that year's sampling campaign was just to establish which method we should be using or recommending going forwards. Uh, what we found was a real range in the performance or, or the quality of the samples that were uh, returned to the surface. Um, and it would be fair to say that all the samplers had problems at some stage. Um, particular issues that we encountered um, consistently were that in the James and Moore uh, sample, um, sample tubes, was the thin walled brass tubes, we were finding that in these pumice, pumice deposits, we were getting gravel sized particles that would dent the sides of the uh, tube. That means that essentially any soil that's coming into the sampling tube is going to be uh, severely disturbed um, by these features which develop on the side of the, the tube. So um, unless you know you've not got gravel uh, in your soil profile, uh, we don't recommend uh, the use of James and more necessarily. Um, when it came to looking at the gel push static, what we found in some cases is that it worked well, but in other cases, uh, we found that the soil would slump visibly in the tube. And this was common for both uh, types of gel push sampler. Uh, the difference here is that we can see um, actually that there has been some disturbance when that happens, and we can uh, established based on field observations that we need to be careful uh, in the interpretation of these results. Uh, so from that study, uh, what we found was that we felt the best results were coming out of uh, the gel push triple tube sampler, and that's what we've generally been using in the studies as we go in the sampling tents uh, going forward. So the majority of um, the testing that we're doing at the moment has been carried out with uh, triple tube samples. Um, one of the things that's really interesting is to think about what these deposits look like uh, when we bring them into the laboratory. Um, so what I'm showing here are a series of um, sample specimens which were cut from the uh, full sample that was recovered in the field, and we've trimmed them down uh, to a size which is um, appropriate for cyclic trials or testing. Um, what I'm trying to show here is the range of materials that we're encountering 
in these pomace-rich uh, deposits. Okay, so uh, I guess naively when I started thinking about pumice as a research area, I kind of had in my head that it would just be pumice as pumice is pumice uh, in a singular uh, form. When we see pumice on the log, it just means that we've got these crushable materials, probably all sands are very uniform in size. And one of the things um, that becomes obvious very quickly is that there is um, a real range, firstly, in the amount of pumice contained within a, a soil sample. So on the left-hand side, here's an example where there's just a scattering of pumice through to this sample here in the third from the, from the left, which has uh, got a very high proportion of pumice. And what you can see as well, looking directly at the figure on the picture on the far left and the picture third from the left, is that there's a real distribution of size. Okay. So um, there's a real distribution, uh, um, there's a real range of these materials uh, in terms of pumice content, size, that implies a real change in the crushing strength of the individual pumice grains within those samples. And so uh, one thing that becomes apparent very quickly is that these soils are very variable and they're going to be very uh, complex. Um, what that means then as an implication for us going forwards is that if we want to have any chance to try and understand how to um, look at these materials in the field, we're going to need some really good tools to allow us to characterize these soils in the laboratory. Um, one of the things that um, appeared to be missing very early on was an ability to even just talk quantitatively about the amount of pumice um, in a soil specimen. Um, often when you look at the literature, people are trying to characterize the response of a particular deposit. Uh, for instance, if you go to Japan, you might encounter permissive soils in the Shirazu soil types. Okay, but there's no systematic, seems like there's been no systematic attempt uh, to put a number on how much pumice uh, you have in a, in a particular soil program. Uh, so this was an aspect that um, I was keen to uh, investigate further. And if we consider the key characteristics of pumice grains, that firstly they're crushable, uh, they contain these internal void structures, and that as a result of the internal void structures, uh, they're very lightweight, um, gravity-based methods appear to be very promising. Um, in particular, if the pumice grains are lighter than normal soil grains for their size, then it implies immediately that you could potentially try and estimate pumice content based on a measurement of specific gravity. Um, however, a key issue is summarized in this plot on the left-hand side. <coughs> what I'm showing is the specific gravity that you would measure using conventional techniques um, for different size ranges of uh, pumiceous soil. Um, one of the striking features um, and this is, I'm showing data from my own study, along with data from an earlier study by Wesley from 2001, is that the specific gravity is size dependent. Um, it's easy to understand why when you look at the structure of a soil grain and realize that you have this internal uh, porous structure. Some of the pores are connected to the surface of the uh, soil grain, so conceivably you can get rid of that. Um, any um, air or fluids inside, initially inside those uh, external voids, but you have internal voids which are not connected to the uh, grain surface. Um, that's what gives rise to this size dependence um, in the uh, specific gravity. Um, when you look at, uh, however, uh, the specific, specific gravity of these materials, if you pick out individual pumice grains and you crush them down um, until they're basically fine dust, what you're left with is a series of broken fragments of cell wall. What that means is you've no longer got that problem with the internal void structure um, causing this size dependence. And what I found was that you actually get a very consistent 
and value for the specific gravity of a pumice strain, or the pumice material itself, I should say, in its crust form. Um, so then, um, what I've developed then is a um, separation technique where I use um, a solution, it's called LST, uh, which has got a, it's an aqueous solution with a maximum density of uh, 2.8 times that of water. If we assume that normal soil grains are gonna have, um, when I say normal soil grains, I mean hard grain soils, uh, have a specific gravity in the range of 2.6 and above. Then what it means is if I can set the specific gravity of the solution to be just above that of the crushed um, uh, specific gravity of a pumice grain, then all of the pumice should float in the solution and all of the not pumice should uh, sink. Uh, so that's exactly what I'm showing on the bottom, hand, uh, bottom right hand side. Um, on the left picture um, is just after adding material into the solution and it's all been mixed up. And then on the right hand side, I'm showing what happens when you leave it uh, to separate over uh, the course of uh, a couple of hours. Uh, so then clearly we can decant the um, stuff which is floating, and then uh, we've, we've now managed to separate out uh, the two populations of material uh, in our specimen. And that's got some very um, appealing side effects, which is that now suddenly we're able to investigate what the properties of these two populations are. So if you weren't able to separate out your um, pumice from your hard grain material, you'd be able to talk about overall size distributions. But now that we can separate the two things out, we can look in a bit more detail as to the um, uh, populations of uh, pumice and what, what they actually look like and what their properties are in isolation. Um, I should say here that I've been talking about uh, the method we I've been using here at Canterbury. Um, my collaborators in Auckland have also developed a second method where they are trying to link the uh, pumice content to the breakage uh, index of the material. So essentially you uh, perform some compaction and then depending on how much the grain size changes, you're inferring a certain amount of uh, grain crushing and therefore um, linking that to the amount of pumice which is originally uh, in the material. Okay, um, for the remainder of the talk, I really want to just introduce you to some of the results uh, that we've been seeing in the laboratory. Um, here are some typical responses uh, from the first set of samples that we obtained from Pakatane. This is what the um, stress paths look like and the uh, accumulation of axial strain against um, cyclic stress. Really, actually, they look pretty reasonable. Um, there's no outstanding features that you would necessarily uh, look at these um, uh, curves and say that it was definitely a high pumice content or a low pumice content. One of the things that is apparent is that we get a very rapid generation of excess forge pressures and entry into the cyclic mobility loops. Um, another feature that we often see in samples with high pumice content is that they're initially uh, relatively dilative, and that's probably coming out as, as a result of the very rough and angular structure on the surface of these grains. Um, if we look at how the uh, strains and pore pressures develop, what you see is again, very, very rapid generation of excess pore pressure, um, and then uh, rising close to one, but then after which um, at lower effective stresses, the um, further generation of excess border pressure is much more gradual. Um, what's really striking though, is that despite getting a rapid generation of excess border pressure um, at relatively low strains, so about 80% excess border pressure is happening um, around about here on this plot. What we see is that there isn't really a marked change in the rates of um, axial strain development with further cyclic loading. Okay, that's a real difference to uh, conventional uh, materials. 
And I would point out here that this has uh, been found previously in the studies of Asadi uh, from Auckland. So this seems to be a particular feature of um, the cyclic loading response of these soils. Um, what I'm showing here is uh, what happens when we took our combined results from all of the testing carried out um, on the specimens we recovered at Fakatane? It's covering a range of uh, pumice contents uh, in the different uh, soil samples that we recovered. So white is for low uh, pumice contents, gray is for medium, and black is for high. And it's also covering a range of sampling techniques. Um, these results here incorporate uh, the testing that was carried out at the University of Canterbury, as well as uh, results from the University of Auckland. Um, one of the key things, however, when we look at this graph is actually that's uh, a one of the surprising features is that despite the real large, the very large range in pumiceous content, we see very similar cyclic resistances in the sense that actually when we look at this combined data set, the, uh, the, the points all appear to fall more or less um, on the same curve. One of the questions then is really, okay, so we know that uh, from this first site, we got a similar curve of cyclic resistance. How does this compare to what we might expect to have seen uh, in the field for those samples? Um, what I'm showing here is the uh, cyclic resistance curve from the latest iteration of the Bullinger and Idris method. So this is the 2016 paper. And uh, what they're showing here, for those that aren't familiar with it, is um, the curves of estimated cyclic resistance at different probability levels um, of manifestation. And um, the data points that are plotted relative to these curves are indicating um, the results of, or, or the observations of liquefaction manifestation following significant earthquakes um, in the past. Um, above the line, they're showing uh, the data points associated with uh, locations or soil deposits, which, is, which showed signs of manifestation. And below the line, largely in these uh, unfilled markers, they're showing um, soil deposits or characteristics of soil deposits, which didn't uh, exhibit signs of manifestation. Um, the real difficulty for us is that if we want to compare uh, our response uh, to uh, those of hard grain soils, we've got to think really carefully about the uh, way in which we try and make our comparisons. We know from before that actually there's a real problem with cone resistance in pumiceous soils. Okay, we've seen that for, we know that if we've got pure pumice materials, the cone is going to be completely insensitive. And we don't yet have a really good grasp on how that relationship changes or transitions with decreasing pumice content until you get to zero pumice content and you get back to your normal relationships. Um, however, one of the things to realize is that the simplified methods uh, based on the CPT, um, its success really relies on the fact that for hard grain soils, the liquefaction resistance is strongly correlated to the relative density of the material. And that within the simplified method of Bullinger and Idris is an acknowledgement of, of that exact relationship. So here I'm showing uh, the relationship which you find in the 2008 monograph uh, by Idris and Bullinger um, introducing their simplified method. Uh, it's taken from the uh, work of Salgado et al. using some average properties uh, for sounds. Okay, so there's an explicit link between the QC1N value uh, that would form the X value, uh, X ordinate of your graph and the relative density of the material. Um, so what that means is that actually there's a way for us to convert our um, field data into a comparison against the existing uh, manifestation observations. And so what I've done um, for our data sets uh, where I had the appropriate index properties is to try and correct for, uh, to take each data point and 
um, rather than talking about a singular uh, curve of cyclic resistance, what I'm doing is I'm taking each point and I'm trying to correct it to an expected CSR that would have caused um, failure in 15 cycles. Uh, I've done that following the methods in the Boulanger and Idris um, procedure. Um, in order to make the comparison against relative density, typically we would be working uh, off a definition based around void ratio. One of the problems is in the measurement of specific gravity of these soils and what it means uh, for intact particles. Mm -hmm. However, there's a form of the relative density which can be expressed in terms of um, maximum and minimum densities. So I've taken the index properties uh, from the Japanese procedure to come up with estimates of relative density. Uh, so what I'm showing in this summary plot then is how our cyclic resistances for each of our test points um, compares against the Bullinger and Idris curve um, across the four sites where we've done our testing and noting that the different colors here are indicating uh, the range of the measures content. Um, one of the interesting things here again is like similar to the results from the uh, Fakutane study, there isn't a systematic change um, in our cyclic resistance with uh, pumice content. Okay, so it seems that in the soils that we're covering, um, with even modest amounts of pumice um, in the material, in the deposit, we're getting a, a scatter of cyclic resistance, which doesn't appear necessarily to be strongly correlated to um, relative density in these soils. Um, of particular interest um, that I want to point out is that some of our latest samples were recovered uh, from Edgecombe and they appear to have very, very high relative densities, which uh, you would typically uh, assume would not be able to liquefy in any way, shape or form. Um, however, we're reaching the laboratory based definition of liquefaction, which is 5% uh, strain. Uh, at uh, typical cyclic resistances, which you might expect to see uh, during um, even moderate earthquakes. So uh, for high relative densities and high, and uh, with pumice, if we've got pumice rich soils, even with high relative densities, we might expect to see some problems. Uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about is just the consequences <laughs> of uh, liquefaction in these soils. Um, the work of Asadi et al. from Auckland have shown that uh, the post-cyclic um, behaviour of these soils when you apply monotonic shearing load um, is very dilative and you can expect to see some relatively large resistances to shearing load. Um, what I'm showing here however is what happens to the volumetric strains. Uh, when we reconsolidate uh, the specimens. This is important because the volumetric strains form the basis for many of our damage indices uh, or damage predictors uh, when we consider the consequences uh, of liquefaction. So these would be the sort of LSN, LPI indices, often make use of uh, volumetric strain. Um, what I'm showing here is the results uh, that um, from Ishihara and Yoshimine in the black lines where they uh, conducted cyclic triaxial tests and um, established relationships for the expected volumetric strain based on relative density and the uh, maximum shear strain during cyclic loading. And what I'm showing again with the different colors is where our samples are sitting uh, relative to those um, lines with the different markers showing uh, the different relative densities. Um, that's a bit difficult to absorb, so what I've done now is I've compared uh, the recorded volumetric strain for each test specimen against those you would predict based off their relative density and the level of strain we took the specimens to during the cyclic phase of loading. Um, the key aspect here is that all of the majority of our test points lie below um, this dashed line, which is the one-to-one -one relationship. It's indicating that for these soils, we, ex we record larger than expected uh, volumetric strains during the reconsolidation process. So as the, as the so forward pressures are dissipating, 
we record larger than expected volumetric strains. And that feature is likely coming about as the higher, as a result of the higher compressible uh, crushability of these materials. So when we apply the cyclic loading, we're getting localized crushing. And so when they re reconsolidate afterwards, we get larger uh, volumetric strains as a result. Um, so really that's a flavor of uh, what we've been working on in this project. Uh, the key aspects for me are that uh, is this recognition that um, these pumice rich soils are really complex and um, are very variable in the field, both in terms of their content and um, distributions in terms of size and uh, properties. Uh, we need to really consider going back to the basics in these soils, developing these tools um, to better understand the properties of these materials from a fundamental point of view. So we've managed to come up with two uh, methods um, so far, which are um, looking at quantifying how much pumice we have in the uh, mixture, but further work is really required to try and understand um, how to talk about things like void ratio on which most of our understanding in soil mechanics uh, rests on. Um, the results from the undisturbed sampling suggest that the crushability of these materials is playing a key um, is a key factor in uh, changing the results of uh, relative to hard uh, grain materials. In particular, we see rapid generation of excess border pressures um, and this reduction in cyclic resistance for soils with very large um, relative densities relative to their hard grain counterparts. Um, we always have to bear in mind that difficulty if we're going to be using the CPT going forwards in these deposits. We have to remind ourselves that relative density is not a good predictor uh, or is not sensitive uh, in uh, pumiceous soils, so we have to be very careful with that. And uh, finally, that uh, reconsolidation strains in these materials appears to be much larger uh, than expected. Uh, so uh, with that, I'd just like to thank um, my collaborators at the University of Auckland, uh, Rolly Arense and his students, um, particular Bakker and Sadok uh, Asadi, um, as well as some of my colleagues at the University of Canterbury, in particular Sean Rees and uh, Mishko Kupanovsky. Uh, finally, of course, Craig Core for supporting this work uh, over a series of years. So thank you very much. All right, thanks, Mark, for the uh, very clear presentation to non-technical audiences, showing us that not all soils are created equal, shall we say. Um, questions from either people in the room or people on Zoom? Kevin. Hey, Mark. Uh, great presentation. Thanks for that. Um, on the uh, aspect of the, uh, the measured uh, relative uh, specific gravity as a function of um, the degree of crushing, so you're crushing crushing grains of ambitious soils to, to assess specific gravity of the underlying constituents yeah. without the influence of the bubbles from the um, from the formation of the grains, right? Uh, can you can you talk a little bit about the um, the procedure you used for the crushing and any thoughts about how the your success at crushing to the finest possible size may or may not influence the, the measured specific gravity because my intuition tells me it's going to be more effort to crush as you get to the very smaller yep. particles so that's interesting yeah so the question was about um how successful was i or what procedures i used to crush the uh, pernicious grains and how successful did i feel i had been at the crushing process um well first one is very easy uh, basically i got a mortar and pestle and i um I spent a few Sunday afternoons hand picking out um, grains that were clearly pumice. Um, and then I would basically crush them down to uh, a fine dust in the uh, mortar and pestle. And I would be passing them through a sieve uh, so I could check the size uh, or eliminate um, grains which were clearly too large after um, the initial crushing. Then I kept crushing them down until they, they basically became um, fines. Um, one of the things I didn't show here was that uh, as part of all the SEM work that I was doing um, during this development of this technique, I looked at different size fractions of pumiceous material 
And what I realized was that if you could get down to um, essentially the um, fine to medium silt size, you were looking at fragments of cell wall at that scale. And so um, basically I felt comfortable that if I could get down to um, a crushed uh, uh, material, which was basically dust, then I wouldn't be dealing with the problem of uh, macroscopic voids um, within cell walls. The trick is also to realize that you only have to break down um, the grains big enough that the internal voids become connected to the outside. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from participants on Zoom? Um, I have a question while we wait for others to ponder their thoughts. You, so you basically showed that uh, all traditional techniques for quartz-like materials are out the window. Um, are there any index parameters that you did find a correlation with? For example, was cyclic resistance ratio a function of grain size or a function of part of mean particle diameter? Yeah, look, I think um, I haven't looked at uh, many other indices yet. Um, and Rolly may want to even chime in on this as well at some stage. Um, I think for me, there are um, a couple of things. Uh, it would make sense for um, the resistance to start being correlated to the mean particle size in the pumice portion of the um, soil mixture, uh, because there's that inherent link um, to the crushing strength or the, um, yeah. yeah, the crushing strength of the material against size. Um, that's basically because it's a weak link phenomenon it finds the weakest plane to break on. Um, so it would, um, it seems likely that there's going to be a link uh, on those um, indices. Um, I guess the other thing that, um, for me that I was trying to um, isolate in this when I started showing these comparisons against relative density was just trying to eliminate out um, the effects of penetration resistance um, in these soils, um, similar to sort of the approach uh, Mishko has taken with um, silty sands, um, I guess in the early 2000s and more recently with uh, the gravel materials in Wellington. So that was the sort of basis for trying to get some comparison uh, against relative density. But I agree, yeah, there'll be other indices. Do you have a sense, is there a minimum fraction where suddenly the pump starts to dominate? Like, is it at 5%? Uh, or is it yeah, look, I think, um, again, a, a really interesting question. Um, uh, for those who maybe didn't hear, the question was, is there a minimum fraction of uh, pumice content where uh, the pumice starts to dominate uh, the response? Um, I think the, the simplest thing is that I haven't found one yet, um, looking at the results from our tests. One of the issues that was still relatively sparse numbers of tests, and actually, um, you know, one of the things I think going forwards is something for me is a move back towards um, very systematic studies in the laboratory. Um, initially, we were just trying to find uh, methods which could be rolled out um, for practicing engineers in the short term. I think the results are suggesting that actually systematic studies in the laboratory are, are really required at this stage. Okay, well, I'd just like to thank Mark again on behalf of uh, everyone in the audience for a great talk. And as always, these uh, presentations are available as a recording uh, after the uh, presentation itself. So thanks very much, and we'll see everyone again this time next month.